little comment. Um, <laughs> Dorothy won't be able to see. Now, I should explain. Technology is a marvellous thing, but it doesn't always work perfectly. So Dorothy can't see me, but she can hear me. Dorothy can see Kieran, but she can't hear her. Kieran can hopefully see William and Dorothy. But anyway, and we're going to have to roll with that. It's way too complicated. I'm going to be doing, you know, I don't know. I'll try hard to fill in the gaps. But anyway, <laughs> welcome again. Dorothy, pleasure to see you. Now, um, you've got a new book, All My Lies Are True, just just coming out. What a brilliant time for um for a book to be coming out. I mean, do, does this does this weigh on you at all that books are coming out at the moment? Uh, well, it's coming out in July, so still what? a bit of, bit of time left. But um, everything weighs on me at the moment. It's, this feels very odd. It's a very odd situation, a very odd world at the moment, isn't it? Um, a lot of the stuff that you find really important feels really trivial now, and the stuff that feels trivial has always felt yeah. trivial, kind of feels important to keep us all going. So... It's very strange. It is very, very strange. But there's all this stuff that you presumably should have been doing now in the launch up to this book, which is your 16th, I believe. Yeah, 16th book. Yeah, well, that's, um, and that's the, that's the problem, isn't it? You kind of, you want to be pushing your books and you want to tell people it's coming out and, you know, you've got the Ice Cream Girls coming out and it's the sequel to the Ice Cream Girls. So it's right. been like 10 years in the uh, making and, basically now it feels like every time I, I go on it's like okay um, I want to talk about my book but I feel really really frivolous and a bit walkish so I don't know well I you know I understand that feeling but I think lots of us are now stuck inside and actually we kind of need yeah. the sanity of being able to think about other stuff as well don't we yes absolutely that's what I mean about the trivial trivial stuff you always thought was trivial like makeup or lipstick or whatever that it's kind of feels like important something that's going to make you feel better like you know me and my quest to make the perfect flatbread which I had managed to do at the weekend you know you've already, you've already preempted my questions I was going to say what else have you been doing I'm going to say flatbread for later because that's too good a topic to uh, <laughs> you, also, you oh, let it out my. you let it out the bag that all My Lies Are True, and I suppose it's no secret at this stage, is a kind of follow-up to um, the Ice Cream Murders. Yes. Why, why do you want to go back there? Um, do you know what? I'm, I'm not usually one. Over the years, I've been constantly saying, you know, I'm not one for sequels or to go back to a story because generally I put my characters through so much stress and trauma that, you know, to revisit them would be really unfair. But... A couple of things happened um, and I thought, actually, do you know what? This is the, uh, I wanted to tell a story about a person who'd been through a really abusive relationship and had, um, and then discovers that her child could be in an abusive relationship too, but she's not sure which side they're on. Are they um, the abuser or the abused? And so I kind of had the setup already with the ice cream girls. So I thought, I'll go back to it because I had um, Verity, who is Serena's daughter, and she's one of the main characters of the new book. And so we went around and found out if Serena um, Verity is a good guy or a bad guy, or as it mostly turns out with most people, she's got her good elements, but also got her terrible elements. So, um, so I went back and I thought it would be the setup was there, so I'd go back and revisit it. Unfortunately, it's really, really hard writing a sequel. I bet. <laughs> I didn't realise how hard it was. <laughs> it was like doubly hard because writing a book's difficult anyway. But when you're... So many people love the Ice Cream Girls. I didn't want to ruin it. But also I wanted to be faithful to the story and the type of stories that I tell. So it was really difficult. I was just wondering, is Verity at all... I mean, Verity means truth. Did you choose that name deliberately? Well, a lot of my names in my books, they I do have a meaning behind the, the main theme of the story. So I'll go through a baby names book, which is actually just here. Look. <laughs> very, very impressive, that. Um, or look online, and then I'll find the meanings um, for the names that kind of link to a theme in the story. 
I don't do as much anymore because there are so many of them now and yeah, yeah. so many people because so I've got to be careful not to name a character after somebody unless it's on purpose because you know if I do that people think it's I'm writing about them and then they get right. upset. Uh, yes. I just want to pause now and briefly say hello to lots of people who've turned out because there's lots of new people who've turned out. People are obviously turning out for you a lot here, Dorothy. But hello to Keith and Sergey who've been a lot. Beverly um, and V. Uh, Barry. Sven. Welcome, Sven. Marie Jensen. And there's a few comments coming up. Susan has made it just through. Um, Joanne Harrison says, read, read them all, Dorothy, and they'll get better and better. Hi, Joanne. Um, Hi, Andy. Hi, Barry. Hi. Rosalind Keener says, I've read all of Dorothy books and cannot wait for this. Ice Cream Girls is my top favourite books. Uh, and um, so hello to everybody else. There's too many names now coming in, but obviously loads of people coming in. Hi, Caroline. Um, so, Kieran, uh, now, this is going to be complicated, but um, Kieran's from the Tamworth Book Club, and I invited her in because I love... I love hearing um, from people who are readers. Like, authors talk to each other. We kind of know what to say a lot. And it's really nice to get all the other people from the book ecology in because we're all having to change what we do. And I was really impressed to see what Tamworth Book Club were doing because you are doing, uh, you've been doing a lot of stuff online since lockdown. Can you tell us a bit about that? Then I'm going to have to repeat some of it for Dorothy, who can't hear you because technology is just fantastic. But it'll, it'll be worth hearing twice. <laughs> Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm Kieran, and I'm the founder member of um, Tamworth Book Club. Um, and obviously, because we can't meet up in real life, um, we've started having some Zoom meetings, and we just had one yesterday. Um, Hold on, I've got a, I've got a photograph. Here we go. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, last it, night. It was yeah. It happened last night. It was really nice to um, check in with everybody. Um, we've all been going a little bit stir crazy. Uh, and so we just needed a little bit of normality. And like I said, it was just really nice to check in on everybody um, and try to keep to the routine. We've made another date for the next meetup. Um, I'm actually also the host of a book club on Radio Tamworth as well. So like you, I do get to talk to authors and grill them. Um, and I, I get to play a little bit of music and generally have a great time. And try to keep to the routine. We've made another date for the next Oh, are you hearing that then at all? I've got my computer on. Ah, uh, OK. Well, that'll be an interesting echo, but that's good. because So you're, you're hearing it about two minutes after us, but that's fine. <laughs> so you're getting that sort of idea. Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing achievement, I think, to do that kind of stuff right now. Because we do, I mean, book clubs, I think, have been amazing about how they're bringing disparate groups of people together. But actually, to be able to do it, and so, it's quite useful, isn't it? I mean, people are feeling quite isolated and being able to join together over a book. What, so what book were you reading last night, by the way? Um, so we had Margaret Atwood's The, Han uh, the Handmaid's Tale. I, mean, I think have been amazing um, about how they're bringing disparate groups of people together. It was a together. good read. But uh, actually, the majority honest, of the members had finished the book, um, but uh, the, the feeling of it was quite varied. Some of them enjoyed it a lot more than others. Some of them couldn't wait to get into testaments. Um, and so I think that's what's the joyous thing about a book club. You're, uh, you're always pushed out of your uh, reading comfort zone, really. But you, you're forced to read things that you wouldn't naturally pick up. Um, and so, yeah, it's something different for me. I, I, and I really enjoyed it. So, um, uh, yeah, we have the next book is a Jodie Picou book, The Pact. Right. But you mentioned earlier that you're quite a big fan of one Dorothy Coombson as well. Oh, my God. I'm internalising my fangirling. So I'm trying to be cool, everybody. But really, I just want to look this way and go, I love you, Dorothy. I love you so much. I can't see that, but she's very successfully kissed the side of the screen there, Dorothy. Um, this is how much I love you. Ah, oh, the chocolate <laughs> run. Oh. oh, you can see that. Good. Greg I was getting confused by which bits you can't do. Uh, and I have Greg been. Amber. Su love yeah, him. I've been such a fan for such a long time. My heart is actually going. <laughs> she's very. I, I can't even begin to express how much she's saying she likes your books now. <laughs> You'll have to look back at the video afterwards. You'll I'll get will, it all. I'll watch it afterwards and listen to you, what you've got to say. But, oh, thank you. Thank you. And, I love Greg and Amber. I, I love also, um, if anybody's read Tell Me Your Secret, that's the book I'm on right now, how Dorothy explores the perfect victim. I really enjoy crime thrillers. And um, I think that that book tackles how people take you very seriously. If you're a woman on a night out and you've had a drink or you've been laughing too hard with your friends or you've, you know, danced or what are you wearing? All these things come into it. And if a crime has been committed, were you asking for it? Was it your fault? And 
I absolutely love the direction of Dorothy's writing now. As you can tell, I just want to... Oh, just I've got to pass that on because that's really good. She was talking about... Um, Kieran was just sort of saying how much she loved Tell Me Your Secret and this notion of the perfect victim and of how women, um, when, they're, when they're having a night out and things like that, kind of become victims very easily. Is that kind of right? Not if you're... If I'm, I'm kind of, But that must have been a lot of work to get that whole thing about the victimhood, right? And the kind of... It's a, there's a kidnap goes on in Tell Me Your Secret, and it's quite a scary sort of concept in that in that sort of thing. That must have been quite a tough thing to get right, Dorothy. Well, yes. I mean, the whole thing is difficult to get right and to make sure you do justice to the people who've been through similar situations. I mean, I didn't speak to um, anybody who'd been kidnapped, but I had been... I did speak to a few people who had been in life-threatening situations, situations where they thought they weren't going to survive and kind of build you know later on how it impacts on their life and how they live their life and how um sort of um hard life is for them but even though and a lot of the time that people don't tell other people what happens to them so what they do is they build this life around themselves and they carry on without with this secret with this awful sort of sorrow and pain and fear but no one knows. And so people sometimes think they're a bit odd and, but they don't understand why people are behaving like that. And, you know, the idea, I mean, there's a whole thing with, are they a victim or are they a survivor? I mean, there's two strands to the whole thing and the way we define other people and what's happened to them and how they define themselves and also how we treat people. Cause you know, people can be very disparaging to people who they consider as victims where if someone's a survivor, you know, they think, oh yeah, but at the same time, they're the same person. They've been through the same trauma, but how they're described has a real impact on how they see themselves and how they're treated as well. And, you know, there are a lot of women who are just not believed and because of who they are, you know, yeah. if they've been drinking, they've been they promiscuous or they take drugs or if they're black or you know Asian there's so much that goes into this idea of who's going to be believed and then after that if you're perfect and you're the idea of what people have in their minds as a victim then you've got to go through the whole people you know investigating the crime properly finding the person then having to convince a jury and the world as well that you know what happened to you is um, not your fault and you didn't bring it upon yourself which is a lot of the time this very tacit victim blaming that goes on but things people say so they don't necessarily say you know what were you wearing anymore so much as why were you there are you sure you said no are you sure you you didn't kind of give mixed signals constantly um there's this constant reassessing that a person who's been in that situation needs to go through and that's what i wanted to get across in the book that you know you can that you should be allowed to make mistakes and something bad happens to you, but other people don't dismiss it or blame you for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, you've got this huge range of books and yet you've been published in various different ways because some of your books get put into sort of um, women's fiction or romantic fiction. I don't know which, which category you'd like to reject most. And then more recently into crime, but very often you're writing about quite similar themes. Does this, does this kind of, how much do you come up against feeling marketed in various things and you're just trying to write books or are you trying to write into genres, if you know what I mean? I I don't generally try to write genres. I just try, I like to try new things and I like to try, um, what's it called? I like to, I like to try stories. I, I like to try a different story in a different way. And when I have the idea for something, it generally um, means that I will have to write a story in that sort of genre. I mean, the okay. biggest, I had my first two books, Cupid Effect and Chocolate Run, they were very much romantic comedies. And those were, the, those were the stories I wanted to tell, you know, a bit of frivolous. And then I came to My Best Friend's Girl, my third book, and I wanted to try something else, try something a bit more serious, tackle a, a bit more of a serious subject with a bit of humour in there. But, you know, I wanted to tackle that. And so that became, the next few books became like, Weepies, known as Weepies. Um, so my best friend's girl, Marshmallows for Breakfast, Good Night Beautiful. They're all kind of very emotional books, um, purely emotional books with a bit of um, 
with a bit of romance and a bit of of um, humour. And then I came to write The Ice Cream Girls. And again, I wasn't that wasn't a deliberate choice to write a thriller, whodunit, or as I call my books, emotional thrillers, because they focus not only on the crime, but on the emotions of the people involved. So it's all about how they respond to this awful thing that's happened to them, because a lot of the stuff that I really love to watch, you know, TV shows and books I love to read, there's a crime at it, at at its heart, but it's about the detection of the crime and finding out who did it. And I always, I'm always very focused on how somebody gets through something so huge um, happening to them. So when I was doing, came up with the Ice Cream Girls idea, I wanted to write about two women who'd been separated um, for 20 odd years and then brought back together and had very similar lives. So I came up with the idea of maybe they were both accused of the same crime. And then when I looked at what um, women are sentenced to long-term prison sentences for, um, is usually killing an abusive partner. So I decided that one of them was going to go to prison and one was going to not go to prison, even though they were both accused of the same crime. And so that became the who done it. So I'm trying to work out which one of them did it. So I didn't actually intend to write a thriller or a who done it, as it were. I just it became necessary for the story to be told. And so then I, lo- I love doing that. I was like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to keep doing that. So yeah. I then wrote um, The Woman Love Before and um, then The Rose Petal Beach and then uh, Flavors of Love, which are all emotional thrillers, like I say. So they're not purely crime books yeah. or thrillers. They have the real emotional element to them. And, and and I've carried on, as it were. There's always a, it seems to be a very much a who done it, or why they yeah. done it element to it, but also about the emotions of the people. So yes, it's a nightmare for my editors. I feel sorry for them because they don't know where to put me and where to shelve me. And you know, it's it's very difficult for them, but they Keep love me really. Keep them on their toes, I say. That's really good. Um, and it's a nice year for you, isn't it? Because you, you, well, it was last year, was it this year? You, you get mentioned in a in a um, book a prize winner, and that, that must be quite a nice feeling. Because I'd I'd um I'd been looking forward to Bernadine Everisto's book, mm-hmm. and then um, somebody mentioned something about me being in it, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" And so then I got it, and then. There I was. There was well, not me. Dorothy Coombson's books. <laughs> she has a new Dorothy I'll Coombson. Do. I'll do it. Even it's not me. Somewhere. It's my book. And what a fabulous book it is as well, isn't it? I mean, oh, that's a real, that's really real and, you know, and I'm so pleased she won the... She so deserved it. And the book yeah, was not just about her deserving it. She'd written a book that deserved to win. And so I'm really pleased that it did win. I mean, to be honest, it should have won the prize. I mean, I, I you know, I think it's the best book of the two, but that's another it thing. I need to sort of um, bring in Kieran here. And I'll, again, I'll probably have to reinterpret. But Kieran, you wanted to come in there. I did, because I wanted to ask Dorothy, when she, um, obviously Ice Cream Girls had a TV adaptation. What does it feel like to an author when they have to hand over their baby to somebody else and then they have to, op- you know, open that to somebody else's interpretation for the t- for you know, like a series or for, for the small screen? I'd love to know. Does it feel really weird to give somebody that much of yourself? So uh, Kieran's asking, like, the, the point at which um, the Ice Cream Girls became television, how weird did that feel to have to hand over something that you'd obviously loved and created to another team? And I suspect the answer to this is not necessarily good. Did you hear that? I heard it. I'm just smiling. Oh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, tact is needed in this answer then the tv thing is really um it's really funny because it's what was, what was it it was uh 2013 it came out didn't it and um you know times moved on and it's very different to my book yeah and i didn't think it was going to be that different to my book um and you know as time goes on I don't get as um, upset, I suppose, about it. But for me, 
there are lots of things they changed and I understand why they changed them because television and books are very different things. So I, um, when I'm writing a book, I'm writing a book to write a book. I'm not writing it with a view to it going on TV or film is that's its form. That's how it's meant to be. And other people come along and they want to interpret it differently. And I, when it was bought, there was lots of, lots of different things went on behind the, behind the scenes and in those things that went on behind the scenes I was cut out of the process completely and um and then I kind of heard about heard various things over the great various um grapevines and then when the, I actually saw it I realized that they would kind of defaulted to a lot of the things that domestic abuse and emotional abuse and domestic, domestic violence and emotional violence defaults to, and the idea that it's all about the physical, it's, um, there is so much subtlety that goes on in emotional abuse, um, domestic violence, it always starts with this emotional and psychological abuse before it becomes physical. And the TV kind of just cut all that out. And when I'm writing a book, like Tell Me Your Secret, Ice Cream Girls, um, That Girl From Nowhere, The Brighton Mermaid, whatever book it is, I always feel a real responsibility to get what I'm writing about accurate, to portray that, that um, subject accurately so that people I've spoken to, they can see themselves reflected in the stories, but also they won't feel that I've just taken their story and sensationalized it. A lot of the time you don't need to do that. You just tell a story and when I saw the Ice Cream Girls adaptation, it was basically all the things that I'd been careful to take out of my book. You know, the idea that young girls seduce older men, that, you know, that black girls are shouty and aggressive, that people who've been to prison are generally from single parent families who are really, um, what's it called? Um, really sort of like scuzzy and, and it just broke my heart because not because it just because of my story, but because of all those people, all those women and people out there who were in bad relationships. Mm. I had a lot of emails from people emailing me and telling me how um, the book had helped them and it had reflected their experience. And then the TV show came out and it didn't do that. It basically showed the stereotype. So a lot of people, I think, would have watched it and gone, actually my life isn't as bad as that. My experience isn't as bad as that. Rather than thinking, you know, this is what my life is like in different ways, in subtle ways, in tiny little ways, and maybe made a change. So that's what upset me the most about it. Not the fact they changed the ending, the characters, the setting, the plot, the killer. Mm. Apart from all that, <laughs> that did upset me as much as the um the fact that it gave the wrong impression to people out there about what domestic violence and, and emotional abuse is all about there's um so you'll have to re read the comments when you get a chance afterwards there's a lot of people giving a lot of love to you there and v fowler and lauren sparks both say the deck the book was definitely better um how do you feel about that you know you, are you um, acting as the intermediary between you and kieran kieran was, was that what you're expecting as an answer then um in a way because when i watched it it was very sensationalized um, yeah. And I agree with a lot of the comments that the books are always better. And I feel like the books are always better because you can play your own scenes out in your own head. You can come to your own conclusion. You, get, you, go, you go on your own journey. And as a, re as a reader, uh, that's entirely what you want. Um, so for the words to play themselves out in your own mind and for you to get to somewhere is why I actually... I uh, don't really watch a lot of television. You might be able to tell. I don't really watch a lot of anything. Um, I've started on Netflix. I'm not really feeling it too much. So books are always better for me. <laughs> Thanks, Miss Georgie. Um, I think what, what um, Kieran was saying was like, books are always better because you can play them out in your head. But I can really see what Dorothy was saying about when you when you spent a lot of time thinking about a book and you've, you've got the subtleties right, because your responsibilities are very different, I think, with a book sometimes. Do you know what I mean? And, and you've done the research and it's your book, your name coming out. You, you might have spoken to people who read books in that area. And then somebody comes along and size 10 boots and uh, tramples all over it. But in that in that in that, um, you know, 16 book career, 
if I could ask you to pick one moment, uh, if you if you had to, if you could only remember one bit of it and one moment of pure gold, what would that be over that time, Dorothy? One moment. One moment. If you'll have one moment just to say oh. this was the moment when I. I don't know. Um, oh, there have been so many. Do you know? I'll tell you two. Two. One. One was um, going into a bookshop on Oxford Street in London and um, seeing my book on the shelves for the first time. And I used to, I used to go into that bookshop all the time, Borders it was, but when it was there and see, yeah. and you know, stand there imagining my book on the shelves. And then the first time the Keeper Effect came out and there it was on the shelves, you know, amongst all the other real books um, with, you know, Dorothy Coombson, The Cupid Effect. So that's one of the most amazing yeah. moments of, and the other one, which isn't as happy, um, is getting an email from somebody who had come over from um, Europe. And she came to England and she'd been through a real trauma and she hadn't told anybody what happened to her. And she was really um, in a bad way. And she emailed me after, you know, some time after this and said she'd gone to a bookshop and had seen Marshmallows for Breakfast, my book, uh, my fourth book, and had bought it on the whim. And she took it home and read it and took it back to her hotel and read it, hostel and read it. And she said it changed her life because she went home and she told somebody what happened to her and managed to get help and you know she managed she managed to tell a teacher who then went with her to tell her parents what happened to her and changed her life and she'd be basically um been thinking about ending her life when she'd come to england so and she said you know reading my book had helped her in such a profound way so that's probably the other end of the most amazing part of 16 years to think i've helped you know unintentionally somebody read my book and it helped them to get help in their own lives. Now Beverly Papalis just said um can we move all these automated captions I had no idea they were appearing live that's going to be quite interesting because I'd love to see what on earth we're saying when they have the automated captions I'm sorry about that I will I will get in into the technology and find a way of prizing them out because we're probably talking complete gibberish in there. Um, <laughs> and Juliet Morrison said can't wait for your new book Kieran, one thing I wanted to ask is like, you know, you're obviously doing the book club online. What else has changed? What are you doing differently right now in lockdown? Um, well, I'm a parent. I have a 16 year old and a 10 year old. So I'm having to do this really weird thing called parenting. Um, and sometimes I look at my husband and I'm like, do you know what you what are we doing here? Like, who signed up for this? Um, I, I, I already work from home. So that's that in essence has, has not changed. Just the demands have changed. I'm trying to homeschool or help out with homeschooling. Um, I'm, I feel that when you're at home, you're eternally on call. People don't expect you to switch off at any point. Um, but that's pretty cool because it makes the day go a lot, a lot quicker. And if they're talking to me about books, I've got all the time in the world for that. Um, I can't get into the Radio Tamworth studios right now because I had heart surgery. So I'm at high risk. Um, so what I have to do now is every Thursday I'm doing Facebook Live such as this um, over on the Tamworth Reads Facebook page um, just to try and keep in with it because obviously I can't get to the studio um, and that's my um, I work with my husband I'm at home with my husband we we socialize together and it's a lot of time to be hanging out with one person so I need that time of normality to get out of the house and do something for myself. But obviously, um, I'm just trying to find a new way of uh, of doing it without actually getting to the studio. Yeah, that's pretty. I mean, I, you you missed a lot of that, obviously. But but the first half was about the joys of parenting at the moment, which are quite. <laughs> um, and I, and I know that um, that you've you've probably got some of that going on as well. You've also got two dogs, um, Dorothy. Is that getting yeah, out? Yeah. Uh, so we just got ourselves two dogs, yes. And they um, that they were slightly alarming because you've named your dogs after food. I'm not sure this is <laughs> this conventional way of doing it. I'm not a conventional person, and I love jollof and I love fufu, so why not? I like it. How do you feel in the park calling after them? 
oh, we're not allowed to take the dogs out. This is part of the, um, because we got them literally the day that lockdown happened, we got the dogs and their puppies. So we, um, they hadn't had their vaccinations. So they've, we've got to wait for them to be vaccinated. So thankfully the vets and the vets all closed down. So everything, um, and apart from emergencies and thankfully the vets restrictions have been eased a bit to so manage to get them vaccinated now. So we've got to wait another six weeks and to um, to have them properly vaccinated and then we can, um, but you know, my husband agreed to those but only because, um, because <laughs> we went through so many names and those are the ones he wouldn't mind shouting out in the park. Lauren Sparks has been up their names. I wouldn't um, mind shouting out Fufu and Jolof. Caroline Grimshaw's just said these are fascinating stories from two brilliant people, and she's right. But now I will show you what the, um, the drawing. She tends to come on and do a drawing of everybody who appears on the show. Luckily, you can't see this. I don't think. Um, now, who would he have? Like, like it was Ruth Ware and um, um, was on last night. I, yeah, they might not. Um, they might not see the best of that one, Caroline. It may not. May not I be. I can see that. Oh, can you see that? I can see that. There might be one of these on tomorrow. So you have to watch that tomorrow. Um, uh, Please don't do that to me. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a blackmail thing. Please don't. No, no, please don't. Uh, you know, I'm looking a bit tired at the moment, so please don't draw pictures of me looking like that. Uh, but anyway, you're making flatbread as well. I've seen this online. Yes. It was actually a very simple recipe. Um, I mean, so simple. You need a flour, you need water, you need yoghurt, and that's it. But I'm not very good at following instructions. So what ha always happens is that I I try and go off grid, off off recipe, and it always ends up with no, not always. Most of the time it's fine, but with those things you have to follow it to the letter, and um, including brushing the top with water. But I've gotten right, you know. I've been tr practicing for a couple of weeks, three or four weeks, and my husband's smiled through every incarnation until this weekend. <laughs> But I got it right. <laughs> when I it's saw that, it's, it's what's it called? It, it's um, cause it's gluten free. You have to, you have to do everything kind of differently. You have to be careful because it doesn't okay. work in the way gluten flour does. So, but I'm, I'm I was very impressed with our with my uh, flatbread from the weekend. Very good. Sorry, but, uh, you were just going to say something there. Yeah, I was going to say that when Dorothy's husband was having um, a crisp sandwich on white bread with butter. My taste buds just went, yes, that is what's, that's a lockdown, you know, that's a diet thing right there. You just need a crisp sandwich every now and again. Kieran's very impressed with your husband's crisp sandwiches. She thinks that's perfect lockdown food. Oh, don't. You know, he said to me today, he said, why don't you just have a crisp sandwich for your lunch? <laughs> I said, what, part two of, of, of the crisp gate? You know, before, ages ago, he, I made him a cup of tea and it wasn't properly full. And I, I took a picture of it and I put it on Twitter and said, is this a full cup of tea? And, you know, he said to me, everyone's going to take my side. And it turned out that everyone did. And then when I put the pr crisp picture on, they said, everyone's going to take my side. And everyone did. It's just <laughs> not on. It's not on. The people aren't on my side when it comes to these I've things. Got, I've got to wrap it up quite soon because I try and keep it half an hour. But there's something I wanted to okay. ask you and I was just saying, I haven't yet um your covers one of the great things about about your covers is that there's always black women in, in your covers more recently was that a struggle to do it because i know we work in an incredibly conservative and risk averse industry was was that a discussion you had at, at any point with the publishers no no I, I mean i've always had black women on the back on the front of my covers if going back to the reincarnation of the cupid effect but from um the first two books were my original publisher, who were Piakas. They they didn't have people on the front, but, but from um, my best friend's girl onwards, it's always had they've always had black women on the front, and um, people might have not noticed. And I've had a few um, what's it called um, emails from outraged people who started reading it and then discovered that it was by a black woman, and the main character was black, and so therefore she had to start the whole story again. Which, <laughs> which seemed a bit strange to me. Um, but no, I've always had black women on the covers. And, you know, I've always been very fortunate that I've worked with editors who yeah. are on the same page as me and who understand that, you know, the main character is a black woman. So obviously they're going to have black women on the, on the cover. 
I know other people haven't been as fortunate and able to get what they want, um, put, you know, cover wise or, you know, I remember one somebody asked me once to change my name because Dorothy's old fashioned and Coombson's too difficult. And I was like, nah, not going to happen. I like my name. I like my name very much. Um, but it does help that I'm very forthright in what I, you know, in what I think should happen. And I have worked in the media industry a lot. I used to be a journalist, I used to work for magazines. So I do know what makes a good cover and I do know what, um, you know, titles and things like that and editing the books. So no, I've been fortunate and I know other people haven't been as fortunate and I hope that's changing. And I hope it's not a big deal and people won't see it as a big deal when they go into a shop and they see a non-white person on the cover and you know and the book is a book on a completely now um a completely it's non-issue and it's a book in any section and it's a thriller or it's a romance it's a sci-fi book and it's it's not something that people have to be aware of or to talk about or you know that people will just see these books on the shelves with different looking people on the front and people different looking people in the sense of different to what we're used to and what we're used to going into a bookshop or a supermarket or a library and seeing and not think anything of it and just picking up the book because they, they fancy the title or they fancy the cover or they fancy the idea of the story. Well, um, I'm, I'm, uh, there's been, that's a very good and very inspiring and serious sort of point, but mostly people seem to be discussing crisp sandwiches in, in the comments now. <laughs> and what we've done. Oh, he had one for breakfast. Um, anyway, there's a lovely <laughs> a chance to see, because people have been saying um, some wonderful things about your books and most and also about crisps. Um, fantastic. Way to end. Listen, thank you very much, Kieran, and thank you very much, Dorothy, for taking some time with me. Uh, apologies for the, the technical stuff that always happens on this, but that is part of the fun. Um, and again, thanks very much. Yes, and thank uh, you. Oh, before, you go, before you go, I have this just came through the post today, and I've got to plug this one because that's <laughs> out. it's not actually out in May anymore because that's the way of the world. But as it came through the post, it did, and so in return for that, I shall also um plug this one which is all my lies are true which is what you can be pre-ordering from dorothy um but yeah thanks again and on that note i shall um say goodbye oh i should buy i should buy uh Gravesend. my brother my my husband really likes your books oh i like your husband i, I gave you? him one of you know when we went with that event together yeah i bought i bought two of books, I? It's more important that we hear about your husband now <laughs> No, I bought two of your books and I came back and I gave them to him and he's read both of them. He really enjoyed them. So oh. I shall get that third one as well. I shall get that one as well. I like your husband a lot. Anyway, finally, goodbye all. And thanks so much, both of you. It's been brilliant. Thank Talk you later. Bye. Bye.